All right, so what I'm going to be talking to you about today is what properties make software long-lived. Now, I know you're all my people. We're engineers. We have engineering minds. And for people like us, we crave order. We love efficiency. We like neatness. And one of the things that frustrates us is change. Raise your hand if you've ever criticized a client or your CEO for having something be a moving target. Is that frustrating? <laughs> Every hand in the room, pretty much. So we would love if the world would just stop, or at least slow down, so that the things we build could keep working the way they're supposed to be working. That's not going to happen. So we need to get better at coping with change. There's been other talks about that today. And we need to get better about designing systems that cope with change without our help. So this is going to be the, the fundamental question I'm going to try to answer today, is what makes something adaptable? In other words, what makes it capable of dealing with change. And I'm going to share two answers from evolutionary biology with you. And I want to warn you right now that I might be completely crazy to try to bring advice from evolutionary biology to software. It's not really going to fit. You're going to question a lot of this. And I'm going to contradict a lot of things other speakers have said today. But bear with me, because I think some parts of this advice underlie a lot of Agile, a lot of the things that, are, that we all know are true. And I think there's going to be some instinctive truth that you're going to find in this, regardless of whether the exact advice might be a little crazy. So first, a little about me. Uh, as, my, as Michael mentioned, I'm currently consulting with the State Department in Afghanistan. Prior to that, though, uh, as recently as May, I was the CTO of Culture Foundry. And at Culture Foundry, we're a design and development shop and product development shop and one of our premier projects was the Kentucky Derby website, the official KentuckyDerby.com. So I'm going to CTO brag, oops, CTO brag a little bit to tell you one of those stories as a backdrop for some of the other stuff I'm going to talk about. So when I first joined the project, uh, there was a very large code base that already existed. It had been around for a very long time. And I'm going to describe it as spaghetti code. I've written my own spaghetti code, so I'm not criticizing the work that came before me. I'm sure many of you have created spaghetti code. But there's something different about this spaghetti code. It was beautiful spaghetti code. Um, it was a very popular website. The customers were happy with it. The client was relatively happy with it. But it was kind of hard to work on. So you can hardly read those words in there. But we had live odds code. And we had code that dealt with special parking instructions that would show up on race days. But if we changed either one, both of them might break. Typical spaghetti code kind of problems. Now, this, this limped along. For a long time, I think it was multiple years, we just kind of left the system as it was. But there was one recurrent problem that kind of kept coming up, kept getting cited by the client as a problem we should try and solve. It's a little bit of a complicated diagram. but. This essentially shows you the way horses get into the Kentucky Derby. So there's a thing on the right called the leaderboard. And on the left is the prep schedule. So the way horses get in the Derby, there are prep races that are held throughout the year. You earn points at those prep races. And then at every race that you're ever entered in, you win money. So the money is split between the jockey and the trainer and the owner. And that complicated system comes into a bunch of uh, automated data feeds that we had access to but weren't using at the time. Um, and all of that data was currently getting manually processed up, run through tiebreakers to figure out which horses were on the leaderboard. So essentially, it was a manual process that happened after every single race. And races happened every weekend for like 20-some weekends a year. So this was a heavily manual process. And it was frustrating to me as an engineer looking at this because I realized that all the data on the left-hand side was either automated already, was in a data feed we could pull data from, or is something we could enter at the beginning of the year and be done with it in sort of a batch process. Always frustrated me, but we never really had a budget to sort of address it. Until a big change happened at the client. There was a new vice president who came in with a big agenda and a lot of money. So we had a big budget project. And he said, we're going to rethink the whole way the website works. We're going to redesign it from scratch. We're going to have two big goals. The first goal, which makes a lot of sense, he was a marketing VP, was to increase the revenue potential of the site. So there's sites that we would refer to that the company also owns that do uh, online wagering. 
They also sell tickets through the site and they can make more money. The Derby always sells out, but they can sell higher priced tickets if they can funnel people to the right ticket that they want early in the process. But the second thing is that he had noticed that they were spending quite a bit of money on our team to do this work for 22 weekends every year. And so part of the goal was to make the process more efficient and to uh, make it cost less to maintain. So that's, that was his goal. So we came into it and we said, well, we know what to do. <laughs> we can rewrite the whole thing. So we created a new data model. We put in our engineering hats and we decomposed it into all these subsystems. We understood the fact that horses become entries when they get related to a race. We understood that points relate to entries only in that circumstance. And that those points come together into a contender, which is a horse that's gotten onto the leaderboard, and then that horse has a rank. So all of these complicated process we put into this thing that we thought was the one true data model, and that was going to solve this problem forever. Um, we wrote a bunch of automated tests. We solved all these edge cases. So the top test is making sure that we calculate points right if there's a tie in third place for one of the races. The second test is making sure that if there's a tie in a race in fourth place, and that creates a scenario where there's also a tie on the leaderboard, that the tiebreaker scenarios are also resolved. We solved this problem all the way. <laughs> Here's what it looks like in pseudocode. Um, the input is an array of prep races, and the output is the leaderboard. It's magic in the middle, and there's no humans involved. So I assume you're thinking, if I'm telling you this example, there's got to be some lesson to be learned here. So you're thinking, what's the but? Well, there's kind of not really one. This project came in on time. It came in under budget. My company made a good profit on it. The VP uh, had a lot of success from the project, was very happy with it. And we got hired to do more work afterwards. Uh, it essentially worked perfectly. That photo that you saw earlier of me standing at the finish line at the Kentucky Derby, well, that photo was taken by another member of our team, and we're both standing at the finish line and not watching some server at the moment the race is about to happen because everything's working great. Until four months later, <laughs> the racing office decided that they needed to internationalize the Kentucky Derby. So they said, we're going to have a Europe road to the Derby, we're going to have a Japan road to the Derby, and they're going to have their own leaderboards. And then those leaderboards are going to funnel into the main leaderboard, and that's going to be the ultimate thing that powers the system. I'm sure the engineer in all of you is going, OK, I can see how we can re-engineer that. We've got the one leaderboard, now we have two, and we can rethink it all. One problem, the budget's gone. He had this initiative to rethink the whole website. So there's not a big budget for a big re-architecture here. The second problem, these foreign races don't use the same data sources and, in fact, don't have any automated data sources. So the new system has to involve humans. I think the best summary I can make of this is by Stephen Jay Gould. This is where we'll transition to be talking about evolutionary biology. An engineer's best solution, underline best, this is the best thing we could do is debarred by history. We kind of can't win. So again, back to the question, what could we have done differently to make this system work better? We were agile in this process. We were iterative. We used TDD. We used all these things we we're supposed to do, and we were still foiled by this change. So I'm going to ask you now to take off your engineer hat, and we're going to think a little bit like evolutionary biologists. Um, but first, I need to address a myth of evolution that I suspect some of you at least might have. So this is a picture of a Katie did. This is uh, an amazing animal that's wing is nearly a carbon copy of the leaf that it's standing on. It's, an incredible, it's, in, it's incredibly effective to keep it hidden from predators. That wing might as well have a copy machine somewhere making copies of the leaves that it lives on. Or maybe you know about this animal. This is a deep sea anglerfish. And that little thing at the top, it's hard to see because this photo is taken with an underwater flash. But that little thing at the top is a light up fishing lure. Now, that fishing lure is so good, it would be illegal to use in California. You can't, if you're a human, you can't do this, but fish in the ocean do this. Now, the problem with these two examples, and they're common, these are examples that you've seen in textbooks, these are examples you've seen in movie, Finding Nemo has a great example of this anglerfish. The reason those appear is that they're rare in nature. These are really interesting creatures, and they give you the accidental impression that evolution is directional, that it tends toward perfection, but that's not actually true. 
evolutionary biologists know that evolution doesn't always go forward. And it doesn't, it doesn't generally tend to ever hit perfection. A better way to describe it, this is from an article in Science in the 70s, is that evolution is a tinkerer. The katydid and the anglerfish are rare examples that we learn about because they're interesting. They're not the common example. But if you were an evolutionary biologist, you would recognize that flaws are actually everywhere. Take wisdom teeth. We, as a species, grew our brain cases so big that all of our teeth don't fit in our mouths anymore. And the adaptation we chose was not to stop growing the teeth. It was to invent something called orthodontia so that we could have a safe way to pull them out. Anybody have a bad back or sore feet? Anybody, well, we talked a little bit about childbirth and children here. Anybody have a childbirth that was like super piece of cake? Didn't have any problems? We're still kind of figuring out this biped thing. <laughs> our evolution has, we're not, we're, our, our frames are not perfectly evolved to just walk around and be in the world. So, I think the point that I want to make at this point is that evolution doesn't have a plan. It doesn't start with a plan. It doesn't follow a plan. It doesn't work toward perfection. If evolution had a desk, that's not what it would look like. It might look like this. Evolution like hoards spare parts. It keeps a whole bunch of glue and duct tape around because being ready for anything means nothing is irrelevant. So let me show you a specific example. This will get a little more into the detail. So this is a panda. Pandas, like all bears, are members of order carnivora. And all carnivores have digits that are evolved to run and stab and scratch. They hunt and kill prey. Now, your dog and your cat are also carnivores, and I bet you can't imagine one of them holding a piece of boo and bamboo and chomping on it like a cigar like that. So how does that, bam how does that panda do that? Well, pandas have an odd evolution. On the left is a, a regular, the paw of a regular bear. On the right is the panda bear. So you can see there that the panda has what kind of seems like a thumb, but it's not a thumb at all. It's not a thumb like we have. You see there's five digits, just like we have five digits. So like your dog or your cat has the same. But this bone spur grew, started growing off the side of the panda's wrist. That scientists believe that it interrupted the tendons that were going to connect to the first digit, which made the, uh, the little thummy thing get a little bit of capability of movement, but it also meant that the first digit didn't work very well. So the panda's thumb is this odd example that Stephen Jay Gould calls one of evolution's jury-rigged solutions. It doesn't actually work very well. It just barely works well enough. It's kind of a little bit like that spaghetti code example I was talking about before. It's not a perfect solution at all. So I want to turn now and talk about some of the, the people who came before Stephen Jay Gould. These are two kind of giants of 1930s genetics. On the left, Sewell Wright, an American, and Ronald Fisher on the, on the left, Sewell, Sewell Wright, American, on the right, Ronald Fisher, a British geneticist. So both of these men have massively influential ideas that are going to underlie a lot of this. So I'm going to walk through a few of them with you. The first one, Sewell Wright invented this idea of the adaptive landscape. This is a conceptual idea. Both he and Fisher were trying to mathematize and create some mathematical rigor to the ideas that Darwin had started. So what Wright thought is he said, OK, there's, imagine we have a three-dimensional space. And the x and y coordinate are going to re represent a particular genetic recipe. And the z coordinate is going to represent the fitness of that particular address. Now, random genetic variation in offspring would put each organism somewhere randomly on this surface. But natural selection would mean that only the ones that landed on the way up this hill would actually survive and live on and pass their genes down the line. So visually, this is what it looks like. And you can see here, this is an example where there's three potential fitness optimal places. But it converges on one because the organisms have to mate with each other. So it occasionally you'll have splits, but most of the time they'll converge on one peak. Now, what both Fisher and Wright would have said about the panda is an example of like a local optimum. So it's an adaptation that works in a local way, but it's not globally 
the right solution. So you can kind of picture it if you get a more complex adaptive landscape like you have here, the panda might be on one of the, on the medium peaks or something. So Fisher's contribution was essentially that this couldn't be the whole story, that evolution couldn't always just proceed up the nearest hill, that something, something has to actually push in the other direction. One of the insights is that if evolution always just proceeded up the nearest hill and got better and better and better in a consistent way, then we would see in the natural world lots of super species that dominate everything. But that's not what we actually see. We see lots of variety. So in order to get variety, he was like something else must be at work. So what he understood is that, well, I'm just going to summarize it because it's pretty well summarized here. The better adapted you are, the less adaptable you tend to be. So if you look at the, the diagram again, if you're an organism that's in the lowlands and you're not very well adapted to your environment, you have a big incentive as an organism to vary your genes wildly, to make your children have all kinds of wild genetic mutations. And because the odds that one of them is going to appear on one, a peak or any space higher than where you are are pretty high. But if you're an organism that's sitting at the very top of one of those peaks, you have very little incentive to have a wild variety in your genes. You have what they call in biology robustness. You want to keep everything the same so that you keep doing what you're doing. So he said that that's the force that works in the other direction. That means we don't always climb up the hill. Now, from this frame of view, maybe I was wrong to kind of criticize the panda. Maybe it's not an incomplete evolution. Maybe it's just undoable. Because if you're sitting at the top of one of those peaks, it might go away. The world is actually dynamic, as we talked about at the beginning. That static landscape we saw earlier is not the way the real world works. It's constantly changing. And so it's important as an organism to not be perfect for today. You need to be able to change for tomorrow. So the panda, if, say, climate change happened to dry up bamboo forests, the panda is going to be better evolved, or better prepared, I should say, to lose the thumb and use the five digits the way all other bears do and hunt and stab and, and catch prey again. So it's going to work better for the panda. So this is an odd example where one of nature's jury-rigged solutions is actually kind of globally better. Uh, even though it's locally sort of a weird situation. So that's the first piece of advice that I'm giving to you today, which is to not evolve more than is necessary. Now, I know some of you, we talked a little bit today about lean, and the ideas of lean kind of say the same thing. You know, don't gold plate things, don't over-engineer, all that stuff. But what's very interesting to me is that the reason lean does that, the whole idea at the heart of lean is eliminating waste and being efficient. But nature does this in an extremely wasteful way. It still does it. It's not doing it because it's efficient. It's doing it because it works on the global grand time scale. I think what this actually is saying is that good enough beats perfect all the time, not just in a, in a uh, efficiency way that Lean would say it does. So hopefully I've stretched your minds a little bit, but I want to double down because I did say at the beginning you might think I'm crazy. So the second idea I want to share with you is a concept called degeneracy. And I know you're probably thinking, well, that sounds pretty bad. Well, that's because there's two words, two meanings to this word. And I'm going to be sharing with you the one from science and biology. So this is a quick summary of what the word degeneracy means. Degeneracy is when you have different structural arrangements leading to the same outcome. So you can kind of think of this um, as a corollary or a competitor, I guess, to the idea of redundancy. And in nature, you have both redundancy and degeneracy. I think when we're in an engineering mindset and we look at this example and we say, OK, I am willing to tolerate some redundancy. We make redundant web servers all the time. Because if one fails, the other one can take over. But this idea would say, you should make other web servers, but you should make them all different, maintain them in different ways, and make them all different from one another. And I think all of us would go, well, that's just insane. Why would anyone want to do that? It doesn't make any sense. But it's everywhere in nature. This is uh, a list of 22 things I've excerpted 
This is kind of the seminal paper in this idea of degeneracy from Edelman and Galley in 2001. And there's a weird uh, coincidence that Edelman and Galley are from the Neuroscience Institute, which is here in La Jolla. I thought that was a bizarre coincidence of giving this talk here. So another paper refers back to this one and says this cites a whole bunch of examples that seem to be hiding in plain sight. That degeneracy is a concept that is understudied probably because the word sounds so bad and is so associated with the negative history of genetics that it may be you know, being overlooked even in biolog biological sciences. But I'm going to give you a few examples to highlight here. So take food sources, for example. Our bodies need lots of different nutrients. We need fats and carbohydrates and proteins. And when you're in California, say, and you need healthy fat, I know here you all eat avocados. But avocados don't grow in Portland, so when we want healthy fats in Portland, we go to Voodoo Donuts. <laughs> and if, if you, this is the part that's really the degeneracy. When you come to Portland and you visit me, I can take you to Voodoo Donuts and you will have healthy fats and your body will get the same nutrition. And when I'm here, I can eat avocados and not have to eat Voodoo Donuts. That's one example. Another example of 16 immune response you're probably familiar with. The whole reason vaccines work is that there's multiple pathways to activate our antibodies. We're, we're taking advantage of that every time we make a vaccine. Uh, body movements is another one. Uh, I'm sure you've, if you've done any weightlifting, you've heard it's a bad idea to exclusively use machine weights because you're only stressing one very narrow range of muscles and your body actually does a whole bunch of different range. Like just this motion can be done in dozens of different ways with different muscle combinations. And the reason for that is kind of obvious. If I injure one, one of those particular micro muscles, I can limp and still get around and survive. So degeneracy is very beneficial. The last one I wanna highlight is communication. Um, communication is in, has an incredible amount of degeneracy in it. Take just the idea that I want to express, say, appreciation for my wife. I can send her dozens of different combinations of words uh, from my mouth to her ear. I can send her an email. I can send her an emoji in a text message. And I can do that in all kinds of different orders. And one of the ways you know this is you think about Yoda. Yoda talks with completely different structure and different words than any of his use, but we still understand exactly what he's saying. So there's been studies specifically on languages, and there's been recognition that the languages that are the most degenerate are the ones that are the most successful. I think the best way I can highlight this is in college I studied Latin. And I remember I loved Latin. As an engineer, it, there's only one way to do everything in Latin. It's precise. You have the object and the verb, and they work together in a very predictable way, and there's not exceptions to any of the rules. In English, there's none of that. If you're trying to learn English as a foreign language speaker, it's extremely hard. But English is by far the most successful language. I think it's a bizarre trait that we should try to think about when we're thinking about whether we want to embrace this idea of degeneracy. So I want to turn here to the differences in the way engineering works to the way evolution works. This is sort of a side-by-side -side comparison of these ideas. In engineering, generally what you try to do is you simplify things. You make sure there's no unplanned interactions. You want to have control and order and neatness in the system so that nothing interacts in ways that you're not expecting. Evolution seems to encourage complexity and it allows even random interactions. That bone spur that happened on the wrist of the panda, it turned out to work out great. But if you had looked at it at the moment it happened in, say, a stand-up or a retrospective, it would have looked like a terrible idea. In engineering, you begin with the end in, the, in mind, but in evolution, you tinker and experiment the whole way. In engineering, we have the idea of the single responsibility principle. In evolution, it seems to solve everything multiple ways and have, make everything have multiple uses. Um, lastly, in engineering, we use redundancy only to avoid predictable failures. We think about which ways could this fail, and then we try to plan for that. But we're still predicting for the future when we do that, and we're not good at it. Evolution uses degeneracy to solve the same problem as redundancy, but it gets an added benefit that there's now new random interactions in the system that end up possibly being beneficial. I think this is an incredibly powerful idea that we might be underutilizing in software.
So I want to have a disclaimer for the moment because I don't want anyone to go back to their CEO or their business partner say, I went to this great conference and Aaron Longwell came up and said, hey, we should start planning less and we should start writing random code and not really doing anything to the best of our ability and just stopping when it's kind of a shitty first version. And you know, think about the fact that evolution has limitless resources and you probably have limited resources. If you're short on cash, there's only a limited amount of benefit you can get out of this. But if you're swimming in gold coins like Scrooge McDuck, let's say if you are at Apple, I think this is probably precisely how you would want to run your business. And I think in the act of giving researching and giving this talk, I used to kind of have some contempt for some corporate clients that I have worked with or the corporate world in general. And you'd see the crazy inefficiency and stupidity of the way corporate world works. Like you'll have one group hire one firm to do something and another VP doesn't know that that was happening and so they hire another firm to do it another way. And I always thought that was stupid. And now I'm not so sure those big companies are succeeding and they've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> so I kind of want to summarize the lessons I personally have taken out of this, especially from the example I highlighted at the beginning from the Derby. I think the most important one is to tone down our hubris. I had this thought of the solution we were building was the be all and end all horse racing data management system that we were going to create and it was going to change the world and we're going to reuse it all over the place and it was going to be amazing. It only ever was the solution for that day, really. So start planning as if it's, as if it's that. Uh, I think we need to reevaluate dry. Don't repeat yourself is probably valuable in certain cir circumstances because of the interactions that it, it can, it, or the problems it can cause. But just eliminating duplication for its own sake does not seem like a good idea to me. Just efficiency for its own sake does not seem like a good idea. Um, be a little more random. Like, don't think you need a justification for everything because evolution doesn't seem to. And value diversity for its own sake. There's no monoculture in nature. Diversity is just stronger, it's healthier, it lasts longer. And I think the last one I want to leave you with is don't lean too much on your experience. This is definitely something I did. As I mentioned in that example at the beginning, I left that spaghetti code there for several years. And it was only after I felt I understood the data model and the process and really understood the, the system that I thought we could build this thing. And by definition, that experience was all about the past. There's nothing about it that necessarily applied to the future. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't always. And so I think not avoiding leaning too much on your experience is a good idea. I think the best summary for the way to proceed in the world is this, I think it's interesting, this is a quote from uh, from Chinese leader Deng, Xi Deng Xiaoping, we should cross the river by feeling for stones. This is a very pragmatic approach to the way we build things. I think this is a much healthier way than thinking about building bridges. Um, so thank you for listening. That's all I've got. I'm really interested to hear.